Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I cordially welcome you on behalf of Water Forum IESL for this important lecture today. I am standing here on behalf of uh, our chairman, Dr. Kamal Lakshri. He, he will come on the middle of this uh, lecture. I am engineer Samad. I am one of the members of this Water Forum. <coughs> Our key speaker today, Professor George M. Hornberger. As a customer, I have to introduce him to the forum. John M. Hornberger is distinguished university professor at Vanderbilt University, where he is the director of the Institution for Energy and the Environment. He has a shared appointment as the Craig E. Phil Professor of Engineering and as a professor of earth and environmental sciences. He pre previously was a professor at the University of Virginia for many years where he held the Ernest Rich and Chair of Environmental Sciences. He also has been a visiting scholar at the Australian Univers National University, Lancaster University, Stanford University, the, Un the United States Geological Survey, the University of Colorado and the University of California at Berkeley. His research is aimed at understanding complex water energy climate interrelationships and at how hydrological process affect the transport of dissolved and suspended constituents through catchments and aquifers. He is an ISI highly cited researcher in environmental sciences and engineering a recognition given to the top 250 individual researchers in each of 21 subject categories. There's a long list here, anyhow I have to read it. <laughs> Hamburger is a fellow of the American Geographical Union, AGU, a fellow of the Geological Society of America and a fellow of the Association for Women in Science. He was president of hydrology section of AGU from 2006 to 2018. He has served on numerous boards and committees of the national academies, including as chair of Commission on Environment and Resources from 1996 to 2000, and chair of the board on Earth Sciences and Resources from 2003 to 2009. He currently chairs the National Academies, Water Science and Technology Boards. He is currently chairs the Geoscience Policy Committee of the American Institute and the Special Scientific Committee on Unconventional Oil and Gas Development of the Health Effect Institute. He is a member of the Advisory Committee for the Geosciences Directorate at the National Science Foundation and of the Geoscience Public Policy Committee of the Geological Society of America. Professor Hanberger won the Robert E. Horn Award for Hydrology Section from the AGU in 1993. In 1995, he received the John Wesley Powell Award from the USGS. In 1999, he was presented with the Excellence in Geophysical Education Award by the AGU and 2007, he was elected Virginia Outstanding Scientist. Professor Hanberger is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, having been elected in 1996. This is his uh, long history. The one interesting one, just I got to know from Dr. Udeni, he is involved in some major works in Sri Lanka also. Adapt Sri Lanka, agriculture decision making and adaptation to the precipitation trend in Sri Lanka. This is a seven year program. He initiated this in 2010 and probably he is going to finish it in 2010, 17 September. This is a big or short <laughs> introduction of uh, George Empire. So I am cordially inviting you for this. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, probably more than you needed. 
Um, so uh, it was suggested that I uh, do a presentation on climate and drought, um, water use. Uh, and so what I, uh, I'm going to do is uh, go through sort of two examples, one from the US and one from Sri Lanka. And I think we'll see some similarities, some differences. So, um, not that everyone needs uh, to have a refresher, but just so that we're all on the same page, I thought that I would mention, we talk about drought, we talk about a meteorological drought, uh, which is uh, just a deficiency in precipitation, a hydrological drought, which is an impact on, say, river flow, and of course, an agricultural drought, which uh, relates to the impact on, on crops. Um, and in particular, I want to focus noting that irrigation, when we apply irrigation water, irrigation is a consumptive use of water. So the water is returned to the atmosphere, meaning that there can be a significant hydrological impact of irrigation. Um, so just a couple questions I want to uh, consider this afternoon. Uh, are droughts changing in timing, frequency, magnitude, impacts? Um, and the, the, by the way, these are not easy questions. Um, and the, the second, um, what I want to do is look at whether data analysis can actually provide I ideas. Uh, and in particular, in our Sri Lanka work, we're interested in adaptation. Okay, so one tool for uh, drought assessment is uh, something we call the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Uh, or PDSI, as I'll refer to it. Uh, and you can see that it's a very straightforward, easy, not complicated calculation. All you have to do is follow all of these arrows. <laughs> uh, it's, so it, the point is, of course, that it actually is sort of a very detailed kind of analysis. And when we developed the tool to do the calculation, we actually sat at a chalkboard for days trying to figure this flow chart out so that we could do the calculation correctly. But at any rate, the PDSI uh, gives us an index, if you will, to drought. Okay, so first I want to give you a little bit of background uh, on a, an issue that has arisen in the United States. In the United States, uh, the southeast part of the United States, if you look at the uh, image on the left, you'll see a really small image is the United States. For those of you who are not familiar with the geography, the small box then focuses in on the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint River Basin uh, arises in the state of Georgia and flows southward into the Gulf of Mexico. It's, uh, the the uh, upper end of it is mainly in Georgia small sliver in the state of Alabama, and then the Apalachicola River flows south across the Georgia-Florida border. So the images on the right here, you see the top one is an agricultural area in the Flint River Basin, where it's very uh, highly agricultural. They grow a variety of crops, not, not paddy, but uh, they grow such things as cotton, peanuts, a whole range of different crops. Um, you can see the outline of the basin uh, in, that, in that middle section. The uh, very lightest shade of green to the right is the Flint River Basin that feeds in. The one on the left, the light green, is the Chattahoochee River. And then the dark green down at the bottom in Florida is, uh, that's where they combine to form the Apalachicola. The middle image, the, the interesting thing from the standpoint of um, Florida is there's a Tupelo forest, which is ecologically very important. That's the middle image you can see. And in particular, it's very sensitive to minimum summer of low flows. Okay, and so there's a concern about uh, drought conditions, low flows. And then the bottom, very bottom image, you see there's an important oyster fishery, in particular oysters, not only oysters, but in particular uh, Apalachicola Bay oysters are 
uh, prized and it's an important fishery for, for them and you can see the people uh, taking oysters. So if we look historically, the historical record uh, for this area dates from, uh, the flow record dates from somewhere around 1922 somewhere in there. And um, the plot on the left is, for those of you who are familiar with hydrology, it's a, just a basic probability plot. You, it, it indicates the points normally would fall along a straight line, which tells you what the, basically the probability of occurrence, in this case of low flows is. And what I've done on the bottom left is indicate all those points that fall off the bottom of the line are indicated by dates. The earliest date on there, I think, is 1988, and then there are a whole string in 2000. Uh, over on the right side, on the bottom, you can see uh, a spring. Uh, this is Spring Creek, and what happens is in dry summer periods now, Spring Creek basically becomes a series of isolated puddles. Uh, the top figure, I plotted the number of days in each year where the flow has gone to zero. Essentially, the stream has stopped flowing. Uh, prior to 1980, there were no, there were no years where the flow stopped. And what you see again is that in the later years, Spring Creek is, is drying up. So the question is, um, how about climate? Is, is the climate changing? That, because that's one possibility, right? So here is a reconstruction of the PDSI, the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And you'll notice it goes uh, back to, what, 1650 is the date on the left, some, somewhere around 1610. Now, we didn't have stations back in 1610 in the United States recording temperature and precipitation. So this, when I say this, is, this is a paleo reconstruction, and they basically reconstructed in this case using tree rings. So they can look at tree rings and then uh, calibrate to the later period and then basically deduce what the PDSI would have been in previous years. So this gives us a, a length of record of several hundred years that we can look at the, the PDSI. Um, just looking at it with your eyeball, it's not entirely clear that there's some catastrophic thing going on in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, but one of the things we can do is, is uh, one of the things that people in climatology do is look at a, a spectral analysis, a variance analysis, a time series analysis uh, to look at whether there are periodicities in the data. And so this is a plot of a, a spectrum, a variance spectrum, to show how much of the variability in that signal going up and down occurs at any given frequency, or in this case I've converted it to return period, which is the reverse. Um, and uh, it, this is typically compared with what we refer to as a red noise spectrum because these, there's some persistence in the record. And so when we look at peaks in the blue squiggly line, uh, the significant ones tend to then rise above that 90th percentile. And it's sort of interesting, there is some um, evidence that it goes above at the very high frequency every two or three years. That could be noise. And then there's some indication there to the left, you'll see the peak. That's a multi-decadal, a decadal or a multi-decadal variation, which means there's some suggestion that every 10 or every 15 or every 20 years, there tends to be a recurrence of of drought. Um, another way to look at that, however, is to do what is referred to as a wavelet analysis, which doesn't completely separate the time variability from the frequency. And so it looks at whether there are certain periods of uh, the frequency. And for the wavelet analysis, what you see here is the, the, the the circled highlights are the ones that are most um, significant. And you'll see that back in the seven, from 1700 to 1750, for example, there's some indication that there was a multi-decadal period. So in there, there's some suggestion that yes, 
there were droughts that recurred on the order of every decade. And there's some evidence there around 1950 in the, the, the middle part of the, early to middle part of the 20th century that uh, there were multi-decadal droughts. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't look like there's any consistent set of uh, periodicities. So again, our, the eyeball look at the record didn't seem to indicate a strong change in recent years. Uh, and this more or less confirms it. Yes, there are some variabilities. Yes, there are drought periods that extend for several years. It's, so multi-year droughts are not exceptionally uh, infrequent in this area. And the recent droughts uh, don't appear to be, the recent meteorological droughts don't appear to be uh, extreme. But as I showed you, the river flows were very uh, much reduced in recent years. So here's another quick look at it. Um, the bar graph on the left, now all I did was I picked 50 year periods from the PDSI and I uh, calculated the number of years uh, that were the PDSI was less than I think I picked minus two. Minus two is a significant drought. Okay, and so I just said, okay, these are the number of years. And so um, you can see the last two bars to the, the right side of that are for the 20th century. And actually, it appears that there are more droughts in the early part of the 20th century, like roughly 1900 to 1950, or 1911 to 1961, than there are in the second half of the 20th century, the beginning of the, uh, this millennium. On the right, you'll see I plotted um, river flows in the Chattahoochee River, the Apalachicola River, rather, uh, and I picked the number of days that the flow was less than 6,000 uh, cubic feet per second, cubic feet, I apologize, but the U.S. Geological Survey uses cubic feet per second. Uh, uh, you can roughly get cubic meters per second by dividing by 30. <laughs> I apologize for that, but that's the official reports from the U.S. Geological Survey. The number of days where the flow is less than 6,000 CFS. And what do you see? Well, yes, there are periods, there are years. 1954 was a drought of record, but when one looks at the number of days with the flow is less than 6,000 CFS, you can see how they pile up to the right-hand side of that graph, which are years from roughly 1990 forward. So there's something going on here, and Again, my point is that we also, in addition to looking at climate, if we want to consider droughts, one also has to look at water use. So the Flint River Basin is a very productive basin that, uh, in terms of agriculture. Lots of agriculture, lots of crops, and um, the picture t on the right is a center pivot irrigation system, and it's connected directly to a pump. So they're pumping groundwater up through that pivot that then swings across the field and, and, and waters whatever crop there is. They, as I said, they grow cotton and corn and um, you name it. Uh, on the left, what I've indicated is that the Flint River Basin is underlain by what we refer to as the Upper Florida Aquifer. The Upper Florida Aquifer is a limestone aquifer. It's karst aquifer. Um, it's very highly transmissive. The water flows through it very easily. Therefore, you can pump large quantities of water around. And so here's a potential impact if you're going to uh, irrigate using groundwater because the groundwater is connected to the rivers. And if we use the water consumptively, it's not flowing into the rivers. So here's a graph showing um, the, the panel on the left, uh, sort of the purple dots, are groundwater withdrawal permits. So these are wells that are permitted to withdraw groundwater in the Flint River Basin. Uh, you'll notice that the, the Upper Florida is confi confined, I don't want to, I don't want to mix up uh, hydrogeological terms. Uh, the, 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 the Upper Florida aquifer is mainly in the southern part of the Flint River Basin. 
the northern part is uh, underlain by an aquifer that is uh, not as productive as the uh, as the upper Florida. There are also surface water permits. That's the graph on the right. But you can see there are a lot of permits for um, water withdrawals. If we look at the consumptive use, so here's a plot of the consumptive use, and it turns out that um, irrigation, uh, so this part of the United States is uh, in, in a humid climate, and so it, it rains a lot. And so for many, many years from the time that they, uh, the country was settled, it was rain-fed agriculture. And if the rains didn't come in the summer, they just didn't produce the crops. And it wasn't until roughly 1970 that irrigation even began. And what you see is that it climbed steeply the use of groundwater for irrigation. Um, and then from about 1985 on, it was a pretty consistently high extraction of groundwater. And this is, um, I think this is more than circumstantial evidence that uh, the, 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 the legend on the left, by the way, I converted to cube, the equivalent of cubic feet per second in the river. And so you're seeing the consumptive use is several thousand cubic feet per second, and it occurs in the summer, which is when low flows are prevalent. Okay, so uh, again, the U.S. is temperate, so there's a summer and a winter, and the uh, evapotranspiration in crops are grown ma mainly in the summer, and that's when low flows occur. And the quote on the right here, what I want to point out is that water for agriculture really often competes with other water uses. And if there's to be effective water management to satisfy several different uh, purposes, the management has to take into account the water needs for the whole spectrum of, um, of uses. Okay, second example now, maybe of somewhat more interest for people here, uh, is uh, Sri Lanka. Um, when the, the PDSI code that I showed you, the diagram that I showed you, we originally developed that so that we could calculate the Palmer Drought Severity Index for Sri Lanka. And uh, the graph here of PDSI is for the historical record. So it's for the historical record because Sri Lanka has a meteorological records are quite long and they go back to 1880. And so we can calculate the uh, PDSI from 1980 to basically the present. And uh, this, this one I did for Jaffna, uh, for the meteorological station at Jaffna, but we've looked at uh, stations from around uh, the country. And again, what you see is it goes up and down and up and down. And uh, on, on the map on the right, these were the stations that we uh, secured uh, rainfall data from the meteorological department. So they were all the stations that we looked at. So for the historical record now, here's the, the uh, time series analysis, the spectral analysis, just to see if there's periodicity in the historical record. And uh, what you see here is that there's not a whole lot of evidence in the historical record of significant periodicity in the drought. Down at that left end, you can see that there's some indication that maybe a decadal or multi-decadal uh, signal is there, but it's, it's, it's not, not entirely clear. It's not uh, crystal clear from the historical record. So we can, again, look at a paleo reconstruction. Um, and here, the paleo reconstruction, you can see the, the red dots on the right are from the historical record. The, the entire blue line is from the, the paleo reconstruction, which here goes back to 1300. So we have several hundred years of reconstructed PDSI. The uh, reconstructed PDSI agrees reasonably well with the historical record. It goes up and down at roughly the same times and also um, roughly the same values are both positive and, and negative. Um, and again, the, the, we're interested in, in whether climate cycles, how they affect drought. So 
Here again is a, 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 a spectral analysis. This is the spectrum, the time series analysis for this reconstructed data. And uh, it is interesting because there, one can look at it and say, well, there's something in there at the four to five year period that maybe every four or five years there's some power. In, in other words, loosely speaking, you would expect the drought every four or five years. Uh, it's not quite right as we'll see, but and then there's a peak up here in a decadal, multi-decadal period as well. Now again, a wave wavelet ana this analysis assumes that the whole record is the same over time. That if there are cycles, it, they just continue for the entire 300 years of record. And a wavelet analysis doesn't make you uh, have that assumption. You can look at whether there are cycles that are prevalent in certain periods of the record. So again, here's the wavelet analysis, and again, the dark circles indicate the most significant. So for example, I would call your attention to the years, let's say, 1500 to 1600, and you'll see that there are those yellow uh, areas indicating high variability and the, the, the ones that are circles, and they're somewhere around a decadal, a decadal frequency. So that power that we saw in the time series analysis is, is basically coming from the record, um, well, one of the parts of the record is, is uh, 1700. There are other areas, as you, if, you, if you look across the horizontally, you pick a, a level, eight or 16 years, and you go across, and that tells you when a 16-year cycle or an eight-year cycle was important. And you'll see that as we go across again in the uh, middle of the uh, middle 1900s, there's another indication that perhaps a decadal, roughly a decadal frequency of, of drought may be uh, indicated. Uh, overall, however, um, if, if it were a true periodicity, let's say at four or five years, what we would anticipate seeing is a yellow band outlined with a dark line cutting horizontally across the entire wavelet spectrum. And we don't see that. So there's just an awful lot of variability in droughts. There are multi-year droughts, without a doubt. There are some indication that, they, uh, that sometimes they recur on roughly a decadal basis sometimes roughly on a four or five year basis, but it's not consistent. So you can't count on it being that way for the future, or at least not uh, uh, over, the, let's say, the next decade. Water use, well, again, we, if we're going to look at this realistically, one has to look at water use. Now, this is in our work that I've picked out, but you can see um, uh, the Jaffna Peninsula, here we have again another limestone area, highly productive aquifer, and uh, you can see that the work that was done, you can see the agrawell density in the upper left. So again, similar to the Flint River Basin in the U.S., there's a lot of groundwater pumping. There's, there's not a Chattahoochee River there, uh, but the, there, the sea is there, and so the, the graph on the bottom, uh, the middle, graph uh, there shows uh, salinity and so the seasonal salinity changes and what is happening is that groundwater is being withdrawn for irrigation and this allows seawater to intrude to increase the salinity in the aquifer which is again a, a very serious long-term effect. Again my point is that uh, this box that I the, the comment from others, one has to look, if you're going to manage water, at multiple impacts and multiple uses and come to some kind of balance. It's not, it, it's very difficult to say, oh, we're going to manage water for this and ignore everything else and not expect consequences. Okay, um, I'll move on to a little, uh, a little different set of work, but again, it follows along the same thing. Um, the, the question, well, how about finer timescales? I've been looking over hundreds of years and asking whether there are um, cycles evident. Um, how about at finer timescales, which 
which we often care about for things like irrigation. So one of the things we did is we looked at uh, irrigation water requirements. So irrigation water requirements, just it's just a calculation based on climatological data and knowing how much water plants need to grow. Uh, so the equation there, the only equation I'm going to have in my talk, you can at least be thankful for that, right? It's not full of equations. Uh, the irrigation water requirements of plants are, uh, are simply expressed by the water demand, that's water D, WD, and that's calculated from estimates of soil properties. It's a water balance kind of calculation. And P effective is the effective precipitation. It's uh, adjusted to reflect losses, either infiltration to groundwater, runoff, other losses. And so this gives an idea of the uh, difference between what the plant needs and what is available from precipitation. Um, and we looked at this, we did this calculation for four stations um, in, in Sri Lanka, and you can see them indicated on the, the right. And what we did is we looked at the irrigation water requirements as a function of planting date. And so we said, okay, at, we looked at this only for Yala uh, right now, and we looked at it uh, for planting dates starting March 22nd and going all the way through June 30th. And we basically looked at what, how the, ir the uh, irrigation water requirement changed. And uh, this is certainly not going to surprise uh, those of you who know a lot more about the country than I do. And that is that you'll, you will have noticed that three of the stations we used are in the dry zone, and one of the stations is in the intermediate zone, uh, Bath of Agoda. And you'll see that the irrigation water requirement, this is the variability over 20 years of record, and the, uh, uh, the horizontal lines, solid lines, are just medians. And you can see that the median irrigation water requirements in the dry zone are higher than they are in the inter intermediate zone. That's, that is hardly a surprise. Um, we basically, th th these are just plots of the 20 years of record that we have, and we looked at the irrigation water requirements, again, given different planting dates, June 22nd, June, uh, March 30th, April 1, April 2, etc. And we calculated the irrigation water requirements for the entire period for those years using the, the measured data. And what you see is that in general here, not always, but in general, the irrigation water requirements tend to increase over, over time. They tend to increase. That is, the later planting dates indicate that more irrigation water is required given a later planting date. Um, and I think you can basically see the, heart, the vertical lines, they're green lines on the screen, I'm not sure how they show up there, but those vertical lines are the actual planting dates. So that's when they actually planted at these stations, just from the records. Um, I, th this just basically gives a quantification of what I said. We looked at just the slopes of the, those lines, the irrigation water requirements, and they were predominantly positive, meaning irrigation water requirements tend to increase as planting date becomes later and later. And the red figures in here all indicate upward slopes, and you can see there are a lot more red figures than other figures. So that in general, there is this in increase in uh, irrigation water requirement. We then, basically for the four stations, we calculated, uh, and this graph uh, on the, the axis, the y-axis, if you will, it indicates the average water savings, if you will, in millimeters of water. Average water savings just mean uh, relative to the average irrigation water requirement for over the 20 years, this is how much less would be needed if it's above the horizontal line, and how much more would be needed than the average if it falls below the line. 
And so what you see is that earlier planting dates for the four stations tend to be above that line, meaning that they're water savings. And the numbers below the line, of course, indicate that you're, you, you require more than the average amount of water. So this indicates that uh, potentially, now this is potential, because of course we have the records for 20 years, and a farmer this year does not know what the rainfall and temperature regime is going to be for the coming months. So this is a statistical analysis that on average everything else equal, farmers would presumably do better or at least need less water if planting dates were early. But of course there are other considerations. Considerations about how much risk is you want to take about uh, investing to, to do the planting. But it does indicate that in general the data suggests that earlier planting dates um, require less water. So um, one of the other things that we looked at then was basically to look at uh, spatial variations in climate and soil properties. This was work that uh, was done last semester and uh, led by Udini when he was visiting Vanderbilt and basically what we did is we wanted to look at the data for these stations that you in see indicated on the map. We took a water balance approach. We simply calculated water balance for um, so we used the 1980 something 30 plus years of data and to do water balance method one also has to consider what uh, we refer to as available water capacity this is how much water the soil will hold at um, sometimes the agronomists use the term field capacity how much water the soil will hold against being drained by gravity and the size of the circles uh, for the stations indicate the uh, magnitude of the available water capacity so there are differences in soil and we know there are differences in climate across uh, those stations um, so the, the the numbers reported here are fractional soil water deficit. So we, what we look at is the soil water, what's the soil water deficit? The soil water deficit is how much the soil water is below the available water capacity. So if the water, if the soil is filled up, the, um, this fractional um, deficit would be zero because the soil is full. If the water has been drained down to the plant wilting point there's no water left for the plants and so the um, fractional soil deficit would be zero and so uh, here are the, these plots are for the three zones the wet zone the intermediate zone the dry zone and what you see is the bottom panel for the dry zone the soil water deficit is one meaning the soil is dry for the most part uh, all the way from September to, uh, from September, from um, May to September, February to September, all the way from February to September. Whereas you'll see in the intermediate zone, that's when those bars are up near the top one, and in the intermediate zone you see indications that there are high soil water deficits um, pre predominantly from June to um, September, let's say. So this gives us an indication, and of course the, the bars just indicate there's a variability year to year. Another way to look at it, we looked at the annual uh, average deficit, and that top panel indicates the, uh, an, the, it's basically a frequency plot for each of the years, and what you see, if you look across the, what I called out in the, uh, in the the words here, if you look at the 50%, that's a 50-50 chance going across horizontally. And so what you see is that in the in the uh, wet zone, there's about a, a, a the 50% chance is that the deficit will exceed 0 0.16. 
So that's not a huge deficit. It's a 16% fractional deficit. In the intermediate zone, the corresponding figure is uh, about 0 0.4. So now you're getting down to 0 0.4. And of course, in the dry zone, it's 0 0.72. So that's only, what, 38% of the moisture left, available moisture left on average. We also then uh, looked at some scenarios for climate change. Because we do know that uh, in Sri Lanka, we, we have definitely seen temperature increases. And uh, if we look at the IPCC reports, there are forecasts for further temperature increases. So we looked at temperature increases, and we basically reran using the historical data, but increasing the temperature. And then uh, we also considered you get different estimates for what we might anticipate for rainfall. And some models say the rainfall might increase, some models say the rainfall might decrease, and we figured, well, if the rainfall increases, things will be a little better uh, for drought, not for flooding. Um, whereas if the rainfall decreases, then we wanted to consider that as a kind of worst case. And so the panels on the bottom indicate those, those differences. Oh, oh the, I'm sorry, the panels on the bottom, we looked to see if there was an indication of change from the early part of the record to the late part of the record. So this is historical. And what you see is for the intermediate zone and the, um, and the dry zone, there does appear, it does appear that things are drier in the second half of the record, post-1946, than they were in the first part of the record. The climate change scenario is this graph. I got ahead of myself. Okay, so we looked at temperature change, and uh, temperature change of uh, one degree warming, two degree warming, and then we also looked at a um, three degree warming. Figuring we covered the spectrum. Uh, the top figure is for that's one degree, two degree, and three degree. Uh, and what you see is that there are there are differences for there are differences for the wet zone, but not huge differences. Whereas as you drop down the intermediate zone and the dry zone or the bottom two panels, and you do see that there are these differences, and that there is an impact of reduced precipitation even further than temperature. But temperature change does clearly indicate that we could we should anticipate um, greater well, drier conditions if you will again it's not surprising but uh, this, this is a quantification so what we uh, conclude is that we do have this combination of soil properties the available water capacity because it's lower part, uh, roughly speaking, lower available water capacity because of the soils, lower in the northern parts of the country than in the, particularly the south uh, western parts of the country. Um, but climate also varies across that scale. And so both climate and soil properties affect this uh, soil deficit analysis. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, it actually surprised us is that the changes that we saw are most notable in the intermediate zone. And in the intermediate zone, there's actually, as you know, less of an opportunity to provide irrigation water than there is in the dry zone. And so if the largest impacts occur in the intermediate zone, it could have a significant, uh, really significant implications in that zone. Um, furthermore, as we saw, the exceedance prop probabilities of the annual soil moisture deficits um, could go up by 20% given climate change, uh, temperature increases, just by temperature increases. So there are some you know, potentially uh, significant changes that uh, are likely to occur in the future. Uh, I also just point out anecdotally we did look at um, satellite data for soil moisture, which are available now uh, routinely. And uh, the, the satellite data were consistent with our analysis of the 
uh, seasonal patterns in the soil moisture deficit. So uh, we can we infer from that that uh, it's possible to think that uh, the water balance approach that uh, that we took might be useful for forecasting and you might be able to reset initial conditions periodically by uh, using satellite data and so you can basically could basically move along and, and update your forecast if you will uh, through time I should thank several people but in particular for this talk the work in Sri Lanka that I reported to Sharagunda uh, Udeni Nala, uh, John Jacoby, and I had an undergraduate student uh, work on it, Ashley Rivera. She did the irrigation water requirement work. Um, also, of course, our colleagues in Sri Lanka and uh, NBRO have uh, been just terrific collaborators, and I know I owe a lot to them as well. And the U.S. National Science Foundation gives me money, so I always thank them. <laughs> Um, as I should. Uh, and with that, if, if people have questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you for questions. Yeah. Everything was so clear, no one has a question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was planting much uh, whatever they got at the research station or by uh, some natural set of farmers. Um, it's what is reported in official publications. And so we didn't do any checking, it's, it's just the reports that were available. Yes, but uh, I mean, the kind of is related to the uh, whenever the large system is set by water that the reports for planting dates uh, reflect mostly the large systems, but that's what we had available. We didn't we didn't go to the field to try to check uh, for for this particular part of the work. But that it could that bias definitely could exist. It probably does. By district. They have the Mahavali separation. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, Marvel is a great and the other. Because the non-dance or the cascade, they will operate. Because this is the more than the problem. Have you done any study on the soil moisture retention? Uh, in these areas, now, for example, uh, in the organic matter in the soil, uh, we know that uh, moisture retention is high. Now, during, during uh, night, there is dew formation, and if the dew can be absorbed in the soil and retained, then that can be help agriculture. So, I mean, that is an area which has to be investigated. I don't know whether you all have done it. Uh, yes, so, I mean, question is basically if we went into the field to check soil moisture and the answer is no we did not do field work now we did use reports of soil scientists who had 
uh, have done tests. I think, uh, so I mean on that sense, uh, the numbers weren't totally made up. Uh, they, were, they were what was reported for different regions of the country, um, uh, basically by people who had, had gone out and dug soil pits and characterized things. Uh, having said that, I think that you raise a, a, a really interesting point, and that is um, what we sometimes call a cult precipitation. If you get humidity conditions right, you can actually create dew, and that those kind of conditions uh, certainly can influence uh, soil moisture. Now, as I said, we did look at the seasonal variation using the satellite data. The satellite data. Uh, should be measuring what is there and, and in some sense accounting for the uh, what you did. But um, I think it's an interesting uh, consideration to look at soil properties because some soils, particularly uh, people have been concerned with climate change that soils could become hy hydrophobic or hydrophobicity could increase, which will not be good for infiltrating water into the soil. That's an interesting point, but no, we didn't do field work. We weren't funded to do field work. Actually, actually we considered this point. Like, so that is when we consider the AWC available water content, that we consider the regional oh, soil yeah. types. Oh yeah. Yes, oh yeah. We consider this point. Yeah, we definitely uh, looked at the soil records distributed for each of the stations we looked at. When you consider. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question is whether, you know, with water savings, do you sacrifice yield? Uh, the calculation for the irrigation water requirement um, is done. Um, um, the procedure is the one recommended by FAO. Now FAO, to a certain extent, is concerned with yield. Okay, and so we presumed that if there was a yield penalty, uh, that somehow the FAO would have taken that into account. But to answer your direct question, no, we did not look at yield. We didn't have the uh, data at that level to really look at any correlation. But our, my guess is by doing the calculation for irrigation water requirement, if you supply that water, the presumption is that the yield shouldn't change. Thank you. I'm always interested in the application of science, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry I come from a place I missed much of the presentation. Um, but if you had five minutes to advise the top level press, even president of this country, what would be your message to the leadership of the country about about what could be done to better improve the management of water? <coughs> I love easy questions like that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, it's a serious question, right? Because th this is really where we're, we're headed. We would really like to improve water management. Um, I, I think that what we have to, first of all, figure out is what uh, priorities exist, what the trade-offs are, uh, one, uh, not that I reported today, but uh, one of my students and I looked at basically a trade-off between hydropower and irrigation water, and there are such trade-offs that are made in Sri Lanka. Okay, this is not uh, an, an answer that a scientist could give and say, oh, hydropower is way more valuable than rice, so just, but because that's not the way the world works. Because farmers care about growing rice, and so you have to balance, it's not a simple calculation. Uh, I'm evading your question. I'm trying to evade your question. Uh, five minutes with the president on um, 
<laughs> on what should be done about water management. Um, I do think that one um, does need to take an interdisciplinary approach, that one has to uh, account for the views of different stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders, I personally, as an environmental scientist, include the natural system, i.e. ecological water demands, and one has to then look at um, what a proper balance is. And then we compound it by saying, my gosh, we're changing the climate. And now we don't fully understand what the future will bring, and so um, there's a well-known paper by some people I know called Stationarity is Dead, Wither Water Management. Stationarity is the assumption that hydrologists make that the future will be the same as the past and all of the statistical kind of things that I reported are adequate for projecting into the future and if it's no longer stationary that might not hold. And so um, it, it really isn't a simple answer to the question but I do think that uh, bringing wise people together from m many different disciplines is not an answer that should be given by uh, just natural science, just social science, just farmers, just bureaucrats. I think that uh, one has to really weigh through these various uh, opinions and views of stakeholders. So there you go. I successfully avoided answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, that's right. Well, I mean, one of the things, as uh, Nawa just pointed out, uh, the, the analysis we did does suggest that the intermediate zone may uh, be really important as moving forward as in a changing climate because it, it appears that that's the, the likely to be the biggest impact on a soil moisture deficit, which is, I think, interesting. We think of the, the dry zone as where we apply all of the irrigation water, which is fair enough, but the intermediate zone might be really important. Sorry if I went on too long not answering that question. Thank you. Um, life is complicated. <laughs> um, so there are some similarities, right? Because, for example, in the United States, uh, yes, there are differences certainly in the eastern part of Sri Lanka and the western part of Sri Lanka. But there are differences in the United States. So the southwestern part of the United States is experience, has experienced more recent droughts that are really extreme relative to the eastern part of the country. Um, in terms of forecasting, this is a real, it's a real issue. We do have to grapple with it. Uh, right now, I'll give you my opinion. My opinion, there is no really good, skillful way to forecast drought. Meteorologically, we can get forecasts a week ahead that we now trust. 
Okay, but droughts, what we want is a forecast at least seasonally, several months out. We can't do that using uh, global climate models or regional climate models. We simply can't do it. There's a mathematical reason why we can't do it. And so we have to uh, resort to climatological evidence. And so where we have been reasonably effective and gained skill is where there are what we refer to as teleconnections. So if we can say with some certainty that uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, as one example, really impacts precipitation, then if we have a forecast for El Nino, let's say, oh, there's a pretty high probability that precipitation is going to be below normal. Um, we don't have a lot of faith that that is going to turn out to be very successful for Sri Lanka, partly because you live in an area where um, what drives the monsoon system, if you look at the intertropical convergence zone, I don't want to get too technical, but the, the whole system that drives the monsoon is really important and we're not very good at predicting exactly where that is going to, to lie. Um, now having said that, I'm not a total pessimist. I do think that we can, we can make forecasts. We just have to understand that they're not going to be precise. We could, can and should make forecasts. Uh, years ago I uh, chaired a committee in the United States and we were looking at uh, seasonal forecasting and how it could be used. And we talked to several water managers in the western part of the United States and uh, basically told them, yes, we can do a forecast, but the error bars, the uncertainty is going to be large. I don't know if you can use it. And the uniform answer we got back is, yes, please give us the forecast. We will deal with the uncertainty. We just want to have the forecast. Um, so, you know, people are working on this. They should work on this. I think going forward, we will see that. Uh, I personally think that we have to be careful to not build expectations too high that these forecasts are going to really be precise. We're going to have to, well, I think everybody, everybody understands gambling in Sri Lanka, I think, and so <laughs> uncertainties are a little easier to, to deal with. One of the things we did, we, we actually had a, a game we played with farmers to see how they adapted planting, might adapt planting to drought, and we basically did a little economic game, and at first, well, I'll tell you the story. So I, I director of the Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and Environment, and so the people who did this game first tested it out with a bunch of academic people graduate students, postdocs, professors at Vanderbilt, and it was a horrendous failure because all of the academics wanted to ask little picky questions about, and we thought, well, we're still going to try it. We went out into the field and did it with farmers and it worked beautifully. They caught on right away. Yes, you're talking about planting onions or planting rice. We understand it. And we understand probabilistic forecasts. So I think that we have to basically own up to the fact that we can do forecasts, but we also have to provide the probabilistic estimates of how good they are. Again, I may have successfully avoided answering your question. <laughs> this is time for giving this uh, token of appreciation. So I am inviting Chairman Water Forum and Vice President of ISL, Dr. Tamil Aksar. At the end, word of thanks, Secretary of Water Forum Engineer Nilanti will deliver the word of thanks. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Um,
engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, chairman of the World Forum, ISL, and engineer Samar, uh, chairman, civil engineer section committee, and our most valued invited guests. Uh, here are some familiar faces, but I can't name you. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I the members, ladies and gentlemen. So I got this opportunity as the secretary of the World Forum to propose the word of thank. So I, on behalf of the World Forum, I will say extend my gratitude to Professor George Hornberger. So after you him, there are a lot of terms. So I mentioned few. Uh, professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and Director Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and environment. Uh, I like to extend my gratitude to you sir for accepting to make this public lecture on draft, climate and water use. And here in the lecture you highlighted uh, things mainly uh, like relationship and conventions on uh, like uh, plantation time and irrigation water requirement. Uh, and uses uh, of water for agriculture and the possibility of depletion of water because of that we have to consider those things. So, so finally once again I want to state that we are all most grateful to you sir, Professor George Hornberger. And uh, I like to thank you, Sir Engineer Samar, uh, who got uh, actually uh, who introduced Prof. George Hornberger. And at last but not least, I like to extend my gratitude uh, to the organizing committee and the ISF Secretariat for their efforts in making success this event. Thank you.